On this hunt, I returned to my home county in Michigan for some midsummer fishing, meat eater style. I'm floating the Muskegon River, which served as a hunting and fishing proving grounds for my friends and family when I was growing up. At one time or another, we chased almost everything that moves along this watershed. And while I've visited many deeper and wilder hunks of wilderness since then, this place has lost none of its charm or magic. I'm packing a rod and reel, a bow fishing rig, and a big appetite. The only time I ever got arrested was right there. I had uh, trumped up charges. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. On this trip, I returned to my home county in Michigan to float the Muskegon River down through the swamps and all the way out to Lake Michigan. When I was growing up as a kid, this country was our proving grounds. We chased everything out here from ducks to salmon. And I'm back here now with just a bow fishing rig and a fishing rod to show how you can float this country and feed yourself all the way through. You can think of it almost like a trip down memory lane that happens to meander right past nature's grocery store. About 10 miles from its outlet into Lake Michigan, the Muskegon River opens out into a wide green marsh that teems with life. Here the river braids and diverts into many channels, and my goal is to find a campsite in a clear backwater for my first night of bow fishing. If there's time, I'd love to put an arrow into a fish right off the bat. I get into the zone I'm looking for, drop some gear, and then get rigged up for a daylight hunt. This is a basic bow fishing setup. We got a reel, rubber, tabs. These fish arrows work like a harpoon head where it passes through like this and the catch is coming back out. That's it right there. The key is remembering to hit that button before you shoot. If not, you got impending disaster when that arrow comes back in your face. So you want to release the bail when you shoot. It's helpful to have the drag loose enough where the arrow's gonna get a little pull instead of just bouncing back into your face and cutting a hole in your head. So if you shoot, the arrow will get away from you a little bit. My bow rig is ready to rock. I take a minute to cut a push pull, and just like that, I'm hunting. To shoot fish with a bow, you gotta get a visual lock on the fish. I mean, you obviously have to see the thing. To do that, you need light. Either you have good, strong overhead light and somewhat clear water that allows you to peer down in that water and find that thing, or you use artificial light and come out at night. First thing I'm gonna try here is I'm gonna go up this slough and try to hunt it in the daytime. In Michigan, bow fishermen are limited to taking what are commonly known as rough fish, species that are often poorly regarded by hook and line anglers, such as suckers, catfish, gar, and bowfin. Being back here reminds me of how cool this spot is. In fact, it's even cooler than I remembered. The biodiversity in this marsh is astounding. There's city all around me, just a few miles away, but back here it's quiet and wild and dripping with life. I've push pulled a long ways up this slough and I haven't even touched my bow yet. The problem is this, I'm spooking fish. I know this because I keep seeing the little mud kickups where they've been taken off ahead of me but I'm not even seeing the fish that made the mud kick up. Like, there's a mud kick up right there. Probably has a lot to do with the fact that I'm fighting current. Boom, there goes one right there. See that? Look at that big mud swirl. I think the thing to do, come back in here just before dark with a light rigged up and paddle all the way up this slough. Then let it get dark and let everything rest below you. And then just ride this current down real quiet. There's no way I'm gonna let this whole day go by without shooting a fish for dinner. I head back down to where I drop my gear. I've got to get busy to be ready by nightfall. To hunt fish at night, what I want to do is get these lights rigged up. So I got one peering off that side of the boat, one peering off that side of the boat. So basically what I have to do is just build a little platform right here 
Just get some, lash some sticks in place so I got a platform that peeks out over the edge of this canoe a little bit. And I can mount that light there, that light there, and I'll go those into an inverter, an inverter onto a boat battery. And it's gonna be like poof. And this slough is gonna be crawling with life in the dark. my battery, but we're gonna be loving it. Okay, at this point, got like probably an hour till it's gonna get dark. All them fishies are gonna come out. We're gonna go out and just light this swamp up. well after nightfall, and I've paddled up the slough that I scouted earlier today. I have my lights rigged up and ready to go. It's immediately obvious that this is the way to do it. There's a fish. Oh, miss. A clean miss. The bow fisherman's enemy is refraction, something that needs to be relearned every time you pick up a fish rig. Basically, it comes down to the fact that fish aren't actually where you think they are. If you hold around the fish, you're gonna shoot way over it. So you aim at the fish and then go way, way, way low. Then aim lower than you think you'd ever wanna aim low. And then aim a little more low, and then you're gonna be on the fish. Soccer. See that one? He got injured and broke his bone at some point. See how he healed up all crooked? Fish. There's a bow fin. <laughs> You know what? I forgot to tighten my arrowhead down. Oh, man. After releasing that last fish, I forgot to tighten my tip. That's embarrassing. I can't believe I just did that. That's the stupidest thing you can do. Oh, oh got him. Pin right in the bottom. That's a red horse sucker. See, that's a native fish right there. Well, I've never seen a fish get incapacitated so quick by an arrow. Make sure to tighten my head up this time. Oh, no way I hit him. Oh, didn't get him. That's another native fish right there. This is a bow fin. See how they got that fin all the way around them? They got a spot in their tail like a redfish. But not an attractive fish, man. It's almost like an eel with a bullfrog's head hooked on him. Clearly, there are advantages to bow fishing at night. I have plenty of fish for what will now be breakfast. I'm gonna head back to camp, fillet these out, and salt them. That'll keep them preserved through the warm night. Keep this fish fresh till morning. I was gonna pack it in salt. And using salt to like preserve meats or store meats is a super old technology. The salt, what it does is it just really inhibits bacterial growth. It also dries it slightly, but not in a way that really removes like the sensation of moisture in the fish when you eat it. That'll still be good in the morning. We can cook it then. Okay, I've got the canoe all cleaned out, all that fish slime out of there. Now I want to check on my fillets. And they've been sitting in this salt. Everything around here started to rot overnight. Like I can just smell where I was cleaning fish, fish rot. These things just are totally sweet still. 
just firm, nice, not a fly on them. And that salt makes them really firm too. It's just a great way of doing it. Now I just want to give them a rinse, put them in a little bath in fresh water, draw a little more of that salt out. You can eat them right now, but the salt would be a little bit, they'd, be, they'd taste salty. Okay, so I'm gonna let these soak now in that fresh water, and that's gonna pull some of the saltiness out, and it'll make them perfectly palatable then. While that's doing that, I'm gonna bust over here and make my rack so I can cook these fillets while these guys soak. My last step here is to lay down the, what would be like the wires of the grill, enough to support my fillets. You wanna lay them real dense. You'll find that your fillets will wanna fall through the cracks if you don't. Check, see if this is done. Oh yeah. You see that soaking it in the salt gives it like it break. Why is it breaking like smoked fish? Tastes like smoked fish. It's solid. It's good. But you know, I want to add something to that. One way to talk about whether something's good or not that works for me is to say, would you sell it in a restaurant? Like if you served it to someone in a restaurant, would they complain or would they be happy? I would think that if someone ordered fish in a restaurant and you brought out sucker like this, they might be like, what in the hell was that? They might complain a little bit. With that said, I wanna add another thing. So what now might be like a marginal food, like sucker, at a time would have been probably, you know, a, a great windfall to get when you could get your hands on some sucker and people loved it. So I don't know, if someone eats sucker and they don't like it, I don't know if it's the sucker's fault. Maybe it's our fault. Maybe we're the ones that change. The fact that foods that used to be just staples to people, you know, salted fish cooked on a rack, no seasonings, and we now don't like them, it's like, we change, man. And maybe not always for the better. Now that I have some breakfast in me, I'm gonna save the rest of my fish for snacking as I make my way down the river to try my luck with rod and reel. I'm headed down the Muskegon River to Muskegon Lake. As I float down the river, I'm gonna try my luck with a rod and reel to see if I can't catch some more food. There he is. Oh! Come on, buddy. You're not big enough to keep. They're in a small mouth tucked up in here somewhere. Not big enough. Obviously, catching smallmouth on this stretch of the river isn't a huge problem, but one that hits the legal size limit of 14 inches, that's a whole other story. So now we're getting down we're within a few miles of where the Skegan River goes out in the Muskegon Lake and then maybe seven miles beyond that is where the Muskegon Lake flows into Lake Michigan. And this stretch here is really the most easily accessible for me and my buddies when we were growing up. And then like, you know, I moved away, moved out west. Look back on where you came from and see it as somehow not as exciting or something. You know, it's like this, sense of all the adventures out west. And coming here now as an adult, I just realized how lucky and fortunate I was to have places like this just so close to home. I mean, places where you could get lost in yourself. You come out here and just hear birds, catch fish, not see buildings, not run into people. I mean, it's just a blessing, man. I mean, without this, I wouldn't, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone down the path I went down had the life I had, I wouldn't have been inspired probably. It's funny because after spending you know this time back in the quiet, the camp with no one around, fishing at night with no one around, 
we're coming out. One of the first real markers of where civilization really takes over. 31 Bridge. Makes you wish they had found a different place to put their highway. I'm now entering the lowest portion of the Muskegon River, where it fans out and flows into Muskegon Lake. I'm paddling toward an island where I've hunted and fished in the past. I'll camp there for the night, then paddle westward toward Lake Michigan in the morning. Being on this island, I'm flooded with memories. Time spent fishing and boating with old girlfriends, the time my brother Danny and I set up decoys right in this spot for the early goose season. The only time I ever got arrested was right there. I had uh, trumped up charges, drunk and disorderly, which was legit. But on top of that, I had resisting arrest, which was a real stretch. Had I been fishing that night, I'd have been a lot better off. I grab my bow and head to the hot water discharge of a nearby coal-fired generator plant. The water here is bathtub warm, and certain species, like gar, just love it. The thin profile of a gar makes it a very hard target to get, but at this point, I've had my chance to relearn the principles of refraction. There we go. Not a big one. We're gonna need more for a proper, even a proper one-man fish fry, but that's a 250 million year old fish right there. Not him specifically, but his kind. I'm kind of turning my light on only after a gar comes through, and here's a gar coming through right now. Because I can't, I need to have something to shoot by. There's a better one. That's a more sizable fish. You'll see these things got like, are armored. Besides having this crazy jaw, like little needles, like snake fangs almost. And they got an armor on them. Like, I don't know if you can see that hear this, but like, you can't touch a gar with a flay knife. A gar are excellent meat, but I think like just the difficulty in cleaning them is one reason people don't go after them. I've got enough gar for a fry in the morning. So I head back in the dark to my little island to catch some sleep. It's time for breakfast, and I'm gonna be breading and frying the back straps out of the gar. The key to cleaning gar is you gotta have something that can cut through this hide. Like if you're going out and you know there's a chance you're gonna get a gar, bring something like tin snips. You cannot cut it with kitchen shears. You could maybe do it with a knife and ruin your knife, but you can do a surgical quality gar cleaning with a pair of shears. You come in right here. You can tell from the sound of this that that skin is no joke. Like, I'm not being melodramatic when I say you need shears to get in there. Cut down each side, here and here, and I'll do the same down here. Because really all we're trying to do on the gar is get the back straps out. And you want to peel that heavy shield down like so. Now we're going to pull the loin out. Pulling a gar's back straps is almost identical to pulling a deer's back straps. So there's a gar back strap. And that is, like, legitimately, that is a very, very good fish right there. The next step is to cut up a couple pieces of the gar, roll it in some breading, and then drop it into hot oil. The general fish frying rules don't crowd the oil with too much fish because it, the temperature plunges. You wind up getting, like, a soggier fish that doesn't crisp up. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's good fish. A little fishy, but you could serve it at a fish fry with your buddies and they would have no problem with it. I finish up, pack my gear, 
and head out on the final leg of my journey down the Muskegon River. I make it to the beautiful, blue, endless horizon of Lake Michigan. It reminds me of what the writer F. Scott Fitzgerald said when he climbed to the top of the newly constructed Empire State Building. He said that the view of the land beyond shattered his belief that New York City was the end of the world. And I think in some kind of weird opposite way, but still kind of related, is growing up here with this western horizon, it kind of always gave me and still gives people today this sense of like infinity that just draws you in that direction. You know, like there's always somehow some mysterious other out there. And I think that a trip like this, I mean, if it can remind you of that, it's worthwhile in and of itself. <laughs>